Father, we thank you for bringing us to the Bible study. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. And thank you for our loyalty. We well, thank you for everything you are doing. We ask, O oh Lord, that your revelation be made plain, clear to everyone today. In Jesus' name, bless us as we study. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We come to our Bible study again. And this time, we're in the book, in the epistle of Paul to the Galatians. We've already studied from chapter 1, verses 1 to 9, in two studies. Today, we're starting with chapter 1, verse 10. Please open your Bible, verse 10, all through to verse 16. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. In verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Verse 12, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. In verse 13, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Verse 14, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. And then in verse 15, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I comfort not with flesh and blood. Those are the verses we're looking at today. The authoritative revelation of the saving gospel. The saving gospel, the word of Christ. What Christ has done for you, for me, for the whole world. And what that implies, what that creates, generates in our lives. And it is the gospel, the good news, the word that saves. And it is authoritative. Here Paul, the apostle, gives us the assurance. He said, I certify you. That this gospel, this word that I preach is the gospel which the Lord had given unto him. There's authority behind God, that gospel, power behind that gospel. As we look at these verses today, we're looking at it under three perspectives. Number one, pleasing the supreme God as saints in Christ pleasing the supreme God as we have been born again, we are children of God, we are servants of God, saints in Christ. Number two, preaching the saving gospel as servants of Christ. We we'll please God, then we we'll preach the saving gospel. Number three, personifying the same grace separated unto Christ. Look at number one there. Number one is pleasing the supreme God as saints in Christ. Let's come back to Galatians chapter one, verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, 
I should not be the servant of Christ. Here Paul reveals to us his own goal in life, his own pursuit in life, and his own dedication in life to please God as the servant of Christ. Look at three things there. Number one, the demand to please God above men. Number two, the devotion of pleasing God rather than men. Number three, the damnation for not pleasing God but men. Let's look at number one. Number one is the demand to please God above men. Once again, Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 10. It says, For do I now, that is, I, Paul, do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, if my goal, if my effort, if my kind of devotion is to please men, for if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. What a revelation that to be the servant of Christ, a preacher of the supreme God and a preacher of the saving gospel, we ought to concentrate on pleasing God rather than pleasing men. If our goal, our desire, our pursuit, our concentration is on pleasing man, any man, any woman, rather than God, then we are not servants of Christ. It says in Matthew chapter 17, looking at verse 5, talking about Christ, God himself says, while he yet spake, that is Peter speaking, at that time when they went to the Mount of Transfiguration, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice of the cloud, out of the clouds, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Sanctifier, the Lord Jesus Christ, our perfect example, pleased the Father, God, all the time. He could have pleased Mary, but no. He could have pleased his own disciples, but no. He could have pleased himself, but no. He could have pleased the Pharisees or the Sadducees, but no. He pleased God all the time in everything, in small things, in big things, in great things, in little things, when he was strong, when he was physically tired, when he was weary, when he was hungry, all his desire, all his aspiration was to please the Father God in heaven. And the Father, the Almighty God himself, testified concerning him, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Acts chapter 3. Reading from verse 22, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. In verse 23, it tells us, and it shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people as the Lord Jesus Christ had pleased the Father. And the Father said, Hear ye him. Today we are told again that as the Lord, the Son, a Christ, a Savior, a Sanctifier, a Healer, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. As He pleased, the Lord is giving us the word. And the Lord wants us to look at Christ, His example, 
and look at Christ, the forerunner, and what he laid down for us. And he wants us to hear him and to please him. If anyone, man or woman, high or low, great or small, does not hear him, that prophet, that high priest, that king, that Lord, if anyone will not hear him, then the Bible says, him, her, whoever they are, shall God destroy from among the people. In verse 26, it says, unto you first, God raised, have been raised up a son, Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. The Lord Jesus Christ came. He came to do the will of the Father and he sacrificed himself. He gave himself and now the Lord wants us to listen to him and to please him in first corinthians chapter 15 reading from verse 1 moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel which i preached unto you which also ye have received and wherein ye stand that's how to please god we we'll hear the gospel accept the gospel embrace the gospel stand in the gospel that's pleasing God and that's the demand of God it tells us in verse 2 there it says by which also ye are saved if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you unless ye have believed in vain in verse 3 it says in verse 3 for I declare I delivered unto you first of all I delivered unto you above all. I delivered unto you this saving gospel that came from the Lord. It says, with that which I received, that the faithfulness, and as the demand of God, that what we deliver, what we declare, what we preach, what we pre proclaim, will be that that we have received, how that Christ died, for our sins according to the scriptures and then in verse 4 it says and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures the demand of god if we're going to please the lord is that we look at the Lord, we hear the Lord, we receive from the Lord. If we're going to please the Lord, everything we have received from the Lord, we declare, we preach, we proclaim, and we uh, give to the people. We look at number two there. Number two is the devotion to pleasing God rather than men. When we're saved, our minds are turned away from pleasing men. When we're born again, our hearts are turned to the one who has sacrificed, who gave himself, who shed his blood, who died for us, that we might be saved. When we're saved, our whole attention, our whole affection, then comes upon the Lord. And we fix our gaze, we fix our mind, we fix our affection on the Lord and the Lord alone. We're devoted to Him. We're committed to Him. We're consecrated to Him. And we lean on Him in everything. The devotion to pleasing God rather than men. There will be men that will still demand that we please them. We run after them, we obey them, and we bow to them, and we're subjected to them. But because of our commitment to the Lord and consecration to the Lord, we're devoted to pleasing the Lord and pleasing Him alone. Why? It's the only Savior. Why? It's the only sanctifier. Why is the only one that can take us from earth and take us to heaven? Why is the only one, the very source and the foundation and the fountain of all blessings in our lives? Look at Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 12. 
neither is there salvation in any other that's why we're devoted to him rather than to any man on earth neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved he has done what no other person has done and what no other person can do he shed his blood he died he suffered it was great agony and he endured every sin for us and it is only through that sacrifice only through that shedding of the pure blood of the spotless blood of the sinless blood that we can be saved because of that our dedication our devotion our consecration is totally unto him and this is what he has done we're told in verse 18 of that same acts chapter 4 and they called them and they commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of jesus verse 19 says and peter and john answered and said unto them whether it be right in the sight of god to hearken unto you more than unto god judge ye they said you can judge god is creator you are creature you can judge god is a maker and god is our master christ is our master you can judge christ died for us but you you didn't die for us you didn't give us salvation and you don't have any power to take us to heaven you don't even have the love to take us to heaven if you could but you can't and so you can judge whether which is right in the sight of god whether to hack in unto you for tradition for religion or to akin unto God for salvation and for redemption then in verse 20 in verse 20 it says for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard that was the devotion and that ought to be our devotion our consecration our commitment we're looking at chapter 5 verse 28 in chapter 5 verse 28 saying did we not strictly strictly command you that you should not teach in this name and behold ye have filled jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us they had been warned yet they kept on preaching they said they could persecute them, yet they kept on preaching. They had laid hands on them, imprisoned them, yet they, keep on, they kept on preaching. Now for us today, those of us who are here, those of us who are in the country, those of us in Africa, those of us in the free world, nothing like that had been done against us. No imprisonment. No terrible persecution, no warning from the powers that be, and yet are we as devoted as them? They suffered, they kept on preaching, they had pain, they kept on preaching, pressure on them, they kept on preaching. If they could do that under so great a pressure and persecution, how much more those of us who live today they filled jerusalem the city with the doctrine of christ that jesus saves that jesus heals that jesus delivers and that jesus is the way the only way to the father the only way to heaven and that's what we're to do today. Then in verse 29, we're told, Then Peter and the other apostles answered, And the other apostles answered, Peter had had a change, a great change. 
a great transformation. This was the same Peter that denied the Lord because he made said, you are one of them. And he said, no, I don't know what you are talking about. But now, saved, restored, strengthened, sanctified, filled, saturated, empowered, enveloped by the Spirit, baptized in the Holy Ghost. He had the power now to devote himself completely to the watch of Christ and to the devotion that pleases the Lord. When we're saved, we're so grateful to God that he has done this for us. When we're saved, there's an internal change, internal transformation. And that transformation of heart makes us to devote ourselves unto the Lord. And the fears we used to have, the trepidation we used to have, the trembling we used to have, and the, and the inner, inner kind of weakness we used to have, all that is gone. The power of the Holy Ghost and the strength of the Lord has now come in. And now we can tell anyone who wants to challenge our devotion to the Lord that we ought to be God rather than men. And that we'll find in all these apostles. And then when Paul came, the same thing with all the persecution and all the suffering, he said, am I trying to please men? Am I trying to please God? If I yet please man, then I should not be a servant of God. And then he said, his devotion, his commitment, his consecration, his calling, his devotion was to please the Lord all the time. I pray that that's the same courage will come to every one of us. That same power will come to every one of us. And that same steadfastness and stability to know that God is the only one to obey and God is the only one to subject and submit ourselves to the Lord grant unto everyone the Lord grant unto you that what he has called you to do you will do with all loyalty and faithfulness without any fear of man or consideration for man in Jesus name look at verse 32 in verse 32 it tells us and we are his witnesses you are looking for his witnesses you want to persecute them here we are you're looking for his witnesses. You want to arrest them. Here we are. You're looking for his witnesses. You want to imprison them. Here we are. You want to know the people that are committed to filling Jerusalem and filling our city with the word of God and the gospel of the Lord. Here we are. We are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. I pray that he'll give us this courage. He'll give us this fortitude. He'll give us this loyalty and this devotion in Jesus' name. We're coming, coming now, now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, two verse 4. 4. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 4, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak as God has looked at us and of all the people in the world, He has chosen us, He has selected us, he has ordained us and he has put us in place and he put us in trust for the gospel. Even so, we we'll speak. We are so grateful that of all the teeny multitude of the world, the Lord could choose us because of that. We we'll speak and we give the honor to God who has honored us, who has favored us, and who has sent us forth because of that. We speak not as pleasing men, not as pleasing men. The fear of man will always make anyone.
to please men, whatever the position, whatever the authority, whatever the commission he has, and whatever knowledge he has, fear, fear of man will make us bend, will make us cringe, will make us tremble, will make us fall like a slave, and will make us submit and surrender. The good thing we have, surrender it to the hands of men. But Paul the Apostle said, was saved, was sanctified, were filled with the Holy Ghost, were committed, were transformed, we have the mind of Christ and we have the image of Christ. Because of that, we do what we do. We speak not as pleasing men, but God will try our hearts. And then in verse 5, he tells us, For neither at any time used we flattering words like politicians, neither at any time used we flattering words like those who deceive and they want to uh, kind of deceive people into a particular state of mind neither at any time used we flattering words as she know nor a cloak of covetousness god is witness then in verse 6 it tells us nor of men sought we glory when you please men, you're seeking praise from them. You're seeking glory from them. At that time, you're forgetting God who weighs every action, who weighs every word, and who weighs every disposition. When you please men, you are seeking glory of them. He said, neither of you nor yet of others when we might have been body some as the apostles of Christ. I pray that this kind of heart and this kind of mind that is solidly devoted to the revelation of the word of God, that kind of mind and heart and spirit and soul, the Lord will grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. Number three now, number three is the damnation for not pleasing God but men. The people who reduce God to nothing and they magnify man to everything. The people, the preachers, the readers of the Bible, the churchgoers, and those who profess righteousness, they reduce their God to nothing. The judge of all the earth, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and the Lord of laws and the King of kings, the eternal one who had been from eternity and will continue to eternity, they reduce him to nothing. The one who is going to judge Every act, every word, everything in their lives, they don't think of him, they reduce him to nothing, and they magnify man to such a big a personality that they cringe, they tremble, they fear that man that they have magnified beyond their size. It says such people who so minimizes God and they magnify man there will be damnation for them Romans chapter 8 reading from verse 5 for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit verse 6 it says for to be carnally minded is death, is damnation, is judgment, eternal judgment. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In verse 7, it says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be they are men they live among men the only authority they know is of man 
and the people they look at at the immediate people before them who can punish them who can pressure them who can put them into pressure cooker and cook them and soften them that's the only thing they're looking at they're not looking at god the eternal one who is able to bring them to judgment on the final on the final day because of that the canal in their thinking their canal in their mind and it is their mind it's their thinking that makes them to make man everything and to make god nothing verse 8 verse 8 tells us so then they that are in the flesh cannot please god they're in the flesh they are the flesh they think of the flesh they fear flesh they flatter flesh all their thinking is about a man a woman the men and the women human beings flesh and what flesh can do and all those people who are so glued to the flesh if they don't do this that person will not give them what they're looking for if they don't do that that man that woman will not give them what they're looking for because of that they're scrooge and they're glued to man and to flesh and because of that devotion to flesh and to human beings they can never please the Lord until there is salvation, until there is conversion. And then their mind is severed, their mind is separated, their mind is dissociated from the flesh, the man and the woman they fear. And now they can look unto God and God alone so that they cannot please the Lord. It says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 5. It says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Understand? Uh, Enoch was not the only people, only person on earth at that time. There were men, there were women, there were violent men, there were fearsome, frightening men and women. There were sinners, aggressive sinners, terrible sinners, dangerous sinners in the world at that time. But Enoch being saved, even at that time, Enoch being sanctified even at that time his mind was on God his heart was on God his devotion was unto God his commitment was unto God and he had no day that he wavered he had no day that he was thinking I'm lonely I'm alone all these people are violent and I cannot walk with them. I cannot live like them. And I cannot please them. And they have abandoned me. And I'm alone here. One with God is in the majority. He walks with God. He listens to God. He fellowships with God. And we're told he was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He had this testimony that with all his heart, with all his soul, without any wavering, without any compromise, without looking back, he had this testimony that he pleased God. If God could have such testimony concerning you at home, at school, in a place of work, in the bank, on the road, in the taxi, anywhere you find yourself, when people will try to tilt you, jolt you, and pressure you to please them, 
and you see that what they are demanding is not according to the will, according to the words of God. Some will do it quietly. Some will do it methodically. Some will do it trying to make you bend and trying to make you yield to the maxims of the world. And some will do it violently, pugnaciously. But then uh, you center your mind, you center your affection, and you center your devotion on God and God alone. That's how and that's why Enoch made it at the rapture. He had the testimony that he pleased God. In verse 6, verse 6 tells us, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith for salvation and faith for sanctification. Faith for a change of life, transformation in life. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Faith that even though is invisible, yet is there. Is present there. Even though you cannot see him with your natural eyes yet, God sees you and knows you and knows everything that you do. He sees every idle action. He hears every idle word. And he hears, he knows every, every idle interaction or relationship. It is that faith that even though I cannot see him, he sees me, he knows me, he evaluates me, he weighs everything that I do. It is that faith that God is always there, and God is the rewarder, and God is the judge. It is that faith that makes us, that keeps us focusing on him and looking unto him every time, every day, every moment, whatever betides, whatever happens, whatever does not happen. It says, without faith, the faith that focuses on God, the faith that has your attention and affection in God, the faith that keeps your integrity, that you know, even though this is happening and I don't understand, and and yet I keep my integrity unto God. The faith that makes you trust Him all the time. And that makes you say, whatever, wherever, whenever, I'm going to trust Him. The faith that keeps you in holiness of life, holiness of heart, all the days of your life, every moment of your life. That is the faith that pleases Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is He's there, he's near, he is present, though invisible, yet he's always there. And he follows you about, and he sees, and he knows, and he can tell everything. You believe that God is, and that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That the faith that pleases him. And that is the faith he wants us to live by every time. So that our walk, our talk, our interaction, our association, our spending time or spending any other thing. Our associations, affiliations, they please the Lord every time. And that is what the Lord requires if we're going to escape the damnation of the sinners who please the flesh, but they do not please the Lord. We look at number two now, point number two, preaching the saving gospel as servants of Christ. We're looking at Galatians chapter one, reading from verse 11. Galatians Chapter 1, verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not at a man. Then in verse 12, it says, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul the apostle was unique. It was peculiar. The gospel was given to him, revealed to him by Christ. 
He said, neither received I this gospel from man, man of whatever stature, man of whatever school, school of thought, man of whatever authority, man of whatever power, man of whatever background. I did not receive this of man. Neither was I taught it. This one is not Gamaliel's tradition. This one is not the tradition of the Jews and the tradition of the Pharisees and the tradition of the Sanhedrin. Neither was I taught it. It wasn't even the earlier apostles that taught him this. He said, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He was telling the Galatians and telling us if they disobeyed that gospel Paul preached, they were not disobeying him. They were disobeying Jesus Christ who revealed that gospel unto him. If they rejected, if they neglected that gospel Paul the apostle was preaching, they were not rejecting Paul. They were not rejecting, neglecting Paul. They were rejecting, neglecting Christ who revealed that gospel unto him. If they put that gospel in the mud and trampled on it, if they tore that gospel like a shred paper, if they tore that gospel, they were not hearing the message of Paul. They were tearing, they were shredding the message of Jesus Christ. How could they profess to be saved by Christ and then neglect the message of Christ? How could they profess to have been transformed and changed by Christ and at the same time to belittle and to put in the mud and to trample under the message coming from Christ? He said, for I neither received age of man Neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at three things there. Number one, revelation of the gospel, the truth from Christ. Number two, redemption by God taught through Christ. Number three, recipients of grace transformed by Christ. That's what the gospel does. Look at number one, revelation of the gospel, the truth from Christ. In Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 3. Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore. In few words, then in verse 4, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, revealed unto him, given unto him. Then in verse 5, it says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, not only himself, the apostles through to the grace of God, the saving gospel of Christ, the power of Christ to turn lives around, the power to convert, the power to transform, the power to change, the power to receive a new life, a new mind, a new personality, the power to be turned around, to become a new creature, that power of God, that power through grace, that power for godliness that God gave him. And I was to reveal that to other people. He said, all these things had been reading. For ages not made known unto the sons of men, but now revealed, revelation, now revealed unto him and to the holy apostles and to the holy prophets 
by the Spirit. It tells us in verse 6, it says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. Verse 7, it says in verse 7, whereof I was made a minister. God made man. God made the minister. God created man. God created this minister. And God breathed into man. And that man became a living soul. And God breathed into this man, the apostle, and he became a lively proclaimer of the word of God. It says, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. He said, this is not natural ability. This is not Paul's natural constitution. This is not a, the gene of his father, of his mother. This is not the training of Gamaliel or any other Jewish person. He said, it is the working of his power in me. And he can do the same thing for you. That the power of God will work mightily in your life in Jesus' name. Paul is gone. You are the one here today. And the same grace, the same skill, the same strength, the same power, the same ability God gave to Paul in his own day. To preach the gospel unto people. People are still the same. They are sinners. People are still the same, they are hardened. People are still the same, they are worldly. People are still the same, they are deadly religious. And what Paul confronted in his own day, you confront today. And if God had to give him power and strength and skill and the spirit and authority and the unction, you need the same. He did it for him, he'll do it for you. Look at verse 8 there. It says in verse 8, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He will do it for us, for every one of us. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's fear that makes people ashamed, that they close their mouths. They're like the Dead Sea, they receive from the rivers, but they never give out. If the fear of man is trembling before men, that makes them ashamed. Is exalting man above God that makes people ashamed. It's exalting what people can do beyond what the Almighty can do in our lives that makes people ashamed. But Paul said, the Lord had visited me, had taught me, had transformed me, had shaken away all shakables out of my life. And now I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's come to number two here. Number two is redemption by God taught through Christ. It tells us in Romans chapter 3 verse 24. Romans chapter 3 verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified freely. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, it says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That is, 
the blood of Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. But the blood of Jesus. What can take the stain away? Nothing. But the blood of Jesus. And what can take the human weakness, human depravity, the humanness in us? What can take that away? Nothing. But the blood of Jesus. That's the blood that remits our sin that forgives our sin, that erases our sin, that cancels the judgment that should be upon us, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that have passed through the forbearance of God. In verse 26, it says, to declare, I say, at this time, at this time, the time passed, that's gone. At this time, and in every generation, this is the time. The blood of Jesus is still washing whiter than snow. And the blood of Jesus can still cleanse us as he cleansed the people of the past. At this time, his righteousness to be declared that he might be just and the justifier of them, of him, the believer in Jesus. We're coming to number three here. Number three, the recipients of grace transformed by Christ. Recipients of grace will receive the grace of God. And that grace of God turns our lives around. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? God forbid, verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, dead to sin, live any longer therein? And then in verse 3, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Verse 4 then tells us of the new life. It says, therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The recipients of the grace of God are so transformed by the Lord that now we walk in newness of life. Verse 6, verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Henceforth, we should not be slaves of sin. Henceforth, we should not be subjected to sin. Henceforth, we should not submit any part of our lives, inward, outward, outside, inside. We should not submit any part of our lives unto sin. Henceforth, we should not be the slaves of sin. It tells us in verse 11. In verse 11, it tells us there, likewise reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In verse 12, it says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the laws thereof. We're the recipients of the grace of God and therefore our lives are changed. Our lives are transformed by the Lord himself. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, uh, personifying the same grace separated unto Christ. In Galatians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversation, my manner of life in time past, 
in the Jewish religion, in the Jews religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. I thought they were wrong. I thought I was right. And therefore I abandoned my tent making job and I gave myself full time to persecuting the church and wasting the church. I spent all my days, all my energy, all my strength, everything I got, all my contacts, I spent everything to pursue the church, persecuting the church until I subdued the church. Look at the grace of God can, that can change a man from that forceful, violent, evil lifestyle and make him such a person now that will preach the gospel he once persecuted. Look at verse 14. It says, And I profited in the Jews' religion above many, my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. And look at what he became by the grace of God. The same grace can be given to us that we can be totally changed and transformed, that we will totally depart from where what we were in the past. Now in verse 15, it says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, verse 16, to reveal his son in me. First of all, he gave me the grace coming from the son, the son of God, to reveal the son in me to all the people around. He revealed that grace of Christ, revealed that in me. And to reveal his son to me, revealed in me, revealed to me that revelation of Christ as the Savior, as the Lord, as the King, uh, that was revealed to me, and to reveal His Son through me to the Gentiles and to the Jews and to everyone. He revealed the Son in me, He revealed the Son to me, and He revealed the Son uh, through me that I might preach among the heathen immediately. I confide not with flesh and blood. Immediately as the gospel came unto me and the revelation of the Son came to me, I conferred not, I consulted not, I didn't hold a conference with man, with flesh and blood. I received it from God and I ran with it immediately. There are people who are not men enough to take decisions by themselves. They try to take a decision and then they are looking at how do they feel? What do they think? How will they judge this? How will they approve of this? How will they accept this? And if they see that, you know, people frown at that, the Pharisees frowned at that, the Sanhedrin frowned at that, those who gave him letter of authority to go and arrest the Christians in Damascus, they frown at the change and the transformation, they will cool down, they will pipe down. I wanted to run, but the people are frowning, so I cannot run. He said immediately, I confide not with flesh and blood. Even his own flesh, his mind telling him, what are you trying to do? Do you know the persecution you are going to have? And do you know those who are there already in the church of the living God? You are part of the persecutors and you know what persecution will come. He said, I didn't even confer with my own flesh and blood. Immediately it was revealed to me, revealed in me, and it's going to be revealed through me. I ran with it. I pray that that spontaneity that consideration and that consecration unto the Lord, the Lord will grant unto us that you'll fear nothing and you'll fear none. 
and the gospel of Christ, the transforming gospel of Christ that is given unto you and given into you to transform your life. When it works, there will be no conference, consultation with men, with blood, with flesh in Jesus' name. Three things here. Number one, insensitive religion, graceless character in sin. Number two, indispensable repentance for glorious conversion by the Savior. Number three, immediate response to God's call to service. Let's look at number one. Number one, insensitive religious, graceless character is seen. Look at that again in Galatians chapter 1 verse 13. For ye have heard, if ye, for ye have heard of my conversation manner of life in time past in the Jews religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. It wasn't persecuting building, it was persecuting people, men, women, children, girls, boys, anyone that claimed that Christ was a savior or a savior. He was insensitive to their cry, insensitive to their pain, insensitive to their suffering. That's what religion does. Religion without grace, without righteousness, without tenderness, without the comfort of the spirit, without any milk of affection. That's religion. Insensitive, religious, graceless character in sin. If anyone can torture, if anyone can punish, if anyone can be violent, if anyone can cause pain to another person, not even to a child of God alone, anyone, and the people cry, the people are homeless, and the people are made to lose all their property, and the fellow is acting for religion, and he doesn't care. That's graceless religion that takes a person to hell. And then in verse 14, he said, and profited in the Jewish religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. The people who are so bent on tradition, not on righteousness, not on the truth of the gospel, not on the changing, saving power of the gospel, on tradition that they can make a child hungry and make a child lose even the sense of living. Make a child, make a man, make a woman to desire death rather than life. And they don't care because they are upholding a particular tradition. Those people are not saved. Those people, they think they are right, but they are wrong. And if they do not repent, if Paul had not repented, he would have gone to hell. I pray that Lord himself will have mercy on us that will not defend religion to the injury and to the punishment and to the killing of other people around us in Jesus' name. I would say amen. amen. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Who was before, before a blasphemer and a persecutor and an injurious, injurious person. He now realized he was injuring people. He injured them in their faith. He made them to blaspheme. He compelled them 
to blaspheme. He made them run away from their houses and he made them to run into strange cities. And yet all that time, he was not sensitive, he was being wrong. Who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious? He injured people, but I obtained mercy because... I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Eventually he repented and he said, Lord, what you have me to do? And the Lord showed him what to do and he did just that and the Lord gave him mercy. The Lord gave us mercy in Jesus' name. Come to number two now. Number two, indispensable repentance for glorious conversion by the Savior. Glorious conversion by the Savior. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, it says, And the times of this ignorance, God winged at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So, Paul, did everything he did that time he said he was ignorant he didn't know he thought Judaism was the way he thought sacrificing animal was the way he thought the tradition of the Jews was the way and so the people that followed Christ the Savior the Messiah the final sacrifice our substitute, the one, the ones that followed Christ, the people that turned away from their sin, and they turned away from the Jewish religion, and they turned unto the Lord for forgiveness, and for freedom, and for redemption, and for a change of life, and transformation of life. He thought they were wrong. He was ignorant. But then when the Lord appeared to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is a hard thing for thee to kick against the priests. Then he repented. Then he turned. He said, I've been wrong. And I didn't know. I've been going the wrong direction and the way of damnation and I didn't know what will thou have me to do. It is that repentance, it is that submission that brought him to conversion and to being a new creature in Christ and to this new life. And now the same thing happens to us when we repent. When we turn, I thought I was right in fighting the way of the cross. I thought I was right in fighting the only way that leads to heaven. I thought I was right in fighting the way of Christ. But now I turn. It is that turning. It is that repentance that brings redemption to our lives, new life to us, and makes us new creature in Christ. And then the Lord will overlook everything of the past and then a new life will be gone. He required that of Saul that became Paul. He requires that of you and of everyone that will go the way of the Lord. Look at that again at the times of this ignorance God winked at but now commandeth all men all men, all men in every generation, all men today, all men around us, all men everywhere to repent. In verse 31, it says, because he, the God of heaven, has appointed a day in the which will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. And then he tells us in chapter 20 of Acts, Acts chapter 20, it says in verse 20 there, how 
I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Nothing. Repentance is profitable unto the sinner. Remission of sin is profitable unto the one that comes to Christ. Faith in Christ is possible, is uh, profitable unto everyone coming for the salvation of the Lord, for redemption in the Lord. And then the new life, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. That is profitable unto all men. I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Walking by faith and living in faith and being committed to the Lord like those who have gone before us and were not turning back. The just shall live by faith. But if any, more, any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them who move on, who press forward unto life eternal. That is profitable. The word of God, the whole scripture given by the Spirit of God is profitable unto us in all things. And Paul the Apostle said to all his hearers, all the people, he had declared the gospel to how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly, in public ministration, and privately from house to house. What did he show them? What did he reveal to them? Verse 21, it says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God. Repentance toward God. Indispensable. Any man, religious man, any woman, religious woman, any man, a man who had been so deep in religion, walking, walking, and walking for God without salvation. Any woman who has been so deep and trench in religion, and yet not knowing Jesus the Savior or the salvation of the Lord. It says, everyone now must repent towards God and have faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, number three is immediate response to God's call to service. We're coming to Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 15. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, called me to repentance by His grace, called me to faith in Christ all by grace, called me to salvation all by grace, called me to holiness of life and sanctification in my spirit, all by grace. Called me into service, all by grace. It said, when it pleased God, who had separated me from my mother's womb for this purpose, when it pleased him now to call me by his grace, in verse 16, it says to reveal his son in me. Reveal his son to me. Reveal the son through me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. He obeyed the Lord immediately. He obeyed the Lord promptly. He obeyed the Lord without consultation, asking this, asking that, and to get saved. What do you think about it? What will a sinner think about it who is not saved himself? I want to commit myself completely, entirely, loyally, fully, faithfully unto the Lord. What do you think? What will he think? He has not done it. If he thought well about it or have done it, what are you asking him? What are you asking her? 
I want to follow the Lord. I want to serve the Lord without any rival. I want God to be number one in my life, in my obedience, in my way of life, in my aspiration, in my commitment. I want to serve God without looking here and there. What do you think? What are you asking them? They can't give you the right answer. You look inward. You say, this is what I want. This is what my life will be. All my life, every detail of my life, every moment of my life, every skill that I have, everything the Lord has given me, I want to commit unto him. You don't ask anyone. He said, immediately his obedience was prompt. Explicit obedience clear obedience that everybody could see and they could tell that this man is not just changing a little they could see that the change the transformation the conversion was total and complete through and through and it was thorough immediately i conferred not for flesh and blood acts chapter 26 Reading from verse 15, Acts 26, reading from verse 15. And I said, What thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. That was all for him. I am Jesus. He was speaking from on high, he was speaking from heaven. He knew that this could be no other than the risen Christ who had risen for justification. And so in verse 16, the Lord now began to speak but thrice and stand upon thy feet for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things and the which I will appear unto thee. Then in verse 17, delivering thee from the people, he said, don't worry about the people I'm sending you to. They might look fierce. They might look like giants and you like a grasshopper. They might be heathen. They might be Gentiles. They might be wicked. Whatever they are, I will deliver you you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Verse 18, you are to go there to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. That's your responsibility. That's what I'm calling you to. And to turn them from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And now verse 19 says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient any time, any moment. I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Then in verse 20, it says, But I showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. It didn't vary the message. It didn't change the message. It didn't uh, modulate. It didn't uh, moderate the message. It didn't adulterate the message that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. We're told in verse chapter 16, reading from verse 9. Chapter 16. We're reading from verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, after he had seen the vision, immediately, 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 at the beginning of
of his Christian life at the beginning at conversion, at the beginning at salvation, immediately, and then all through his life as he was walking with the Lord, and the Lord revealed anything to him, come over to Macedonia and help us. That prompt obedience had not left him, that implicit obedience had not left him, that unwavering obedience had not left him, that word immediately and not left his Christian life, his Christian comportment, his Christian submission, his Christian consecration, and his Christian service. Immediately, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. The Lord has revealed to us today how Paul the Apostle received the gospel and his consecration was on God and not on man. He was not afraid of man. What man can do, what man will say, he said he did not confer with flesh and blood. He said as we receive the revelation, so we give out the revelation. And the same thing now is passed unto us. He has revealed unto you the truth of the gospel, the transforming power of the gospel, the grace that comes in the gospel and the righteousness and redemption that comes of the gospel and has shown us the example of Paul the apostle and he wants us by that same grace, in that same strength, in that same revelation to rise up and to receive and to take hold of the gospel and then to go and share it with all other people, no fear, no favor, no cringing, no timidity, but in the boldness of the Spirit of God to go forth and declare that same gospel and the same God that backed him up will back you up. The same power that supported him will support you. And the same grace that was sufficient for him will be sufficient for you. And the same earnestness that he had in defending the gospel, in declaring the gospel, in upholding the gospel, that same earnestness the Lord will grant unto you in Jesus' name. Obey the Lord, not men. Forget about men. Minimize what men can do and magnify the God of heaven. And that power of the Almighty God will never fail in your life. Will never fail in my life. Will never fail in my life. The Lord be with you. Rise up and tell the Lord and say, Lord, I accept that. I receive that. Do it in my life. You helped Paul. Help me also.